Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hi, this is Lisa from This Jungian Life podcast. Joseph, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing the podcast involves substantial expenses, and we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month, and at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. Today, we're going to explore the archetypal underpinnings and the symbolic significance of the cultural phenomenon of teens changing their gender or becoming transgender. And Lisa, Joseph, and I are very well aware that this has been a particular ongoing, well-researched interest of yours, and you have published chapters and books. You've published on an online newsletter or podcast called Quillette, and um, in Psychological Perspectives, which is a Jungian journal. Uh, For our listeners, we'll post those resources for you so you can read them if you're interested. But for now, um, let us try to delve into this highly politicized topic from an entirely different point of view. Yeah, I, I uh, appreciate the introduction, Deb. And, and certainly my first introduction to this topic was kind of seeing it come into my practice. It was kind of coming into my scope of awareness with people that I knew, young people that I knew. And, and particularly my interest, by the way, is with um, kids and teens. And one of the first things I, th- well, the first thing I thought was, oh, this is so cool, you know, playing around with gender and kind of being curious about that, the kind of psychological uh, exploration that, uh, you know, how interesting to really kind of inhabit in in how you present and move through the world, the the opposite gender, if you will. But then I found out that young women were getting mastectomies. I mean, as young as 14. And, uh, and I, you know, sort of that, that it collapsed for me in an instant. And I thought that's a concretization of what ought to be a psychological experience. I'm also aware of that both of us put our hands over our hearts when you said that. Mm-hmm. And it gives me such an instant uh, understanding of how deeply felt and what strong reactions, feeling reactions we have to it. Yes. So even though we want to explore this from a symbolic and archetypal perspective, we really do have very strong feelings about yes. it as well. Yes, and, and lots of people have lots of different strong feelings about it too. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And particularly feelings about changing the body concretely and the removal of the breasts? Well, I, I think changing the body concretely, period, not not just the removal of the breasts. I mean, the truth is that, and you know, perhaps some listeners are very aware of this, perhaps others, this is new to them, but in the United States, uh, the current standard of care for uh, young people, let's say teens, who identify as transgender is to affirm them. And that will mean that if a teen says, I'm trans, that the the right thing to do according to kind of current practice, let's say, among most psychotherapists is to say, well, you know, I affirm you, that's, you know, I want to support you in your journey. And that young people are often being given access to testosterone, let's say, after very a very short amount of therapy. I mean, people will say to me, oh, it takes years. It doesn't. It doesn't. If you're 18, you can get hormones simply with a signature at informed consent clinics like Planned Parenthood. So I'm curious as to why the rush to action and why this concretization. 
I mean, for example, if a, a friend of ours that we just had lunch with said an hour later, I'm hungry, I don't think our first response would be to say, let's go out and get something else to eat. We might be more curious mm-hmm. about it. Mm-hmm. So why does this get foreclosed into medical treatment so quickly? And that's that's exactly right. It is. I mean, you put it really well. It's getting foreclosed into medical treatment very quickly. And I think that's a great question. I'll tell you my understanding of at least part of the reason why is because for many years, trans people had difficulty accessing transgender health care, and it could be very difficult to be able to transition medically. And there were, you had to get letters and it was referred to as gatekeeping. And many people found that oppressive and burdensome and, you know, belittling. And I think this is clearly a case of the pendulum swinging too far the opposite direction. But I can understand the desire on the part of transgender activists to make it easier for people to access transition services. I think we ought to be a little more circumspect when we're talking about people whose brains haven't fully developed. So so I I want to just highlight the differentiation that we're bringing up uh, in this particular conversation is right now we're talking about the phenomena of teenage girls who uh, wish to transition or are curious about transitioning gender and sex and what the current systems either require or provide as that's moving forward. I mean, there's a lot of other issues about uh, transgender that right now are not really on the table. So if you were to apply, or when we have the opportunity to apply a depth psychological lens to, let's say, a 14-year-old girl who comes in through her family for a consult Mm -hmm. with you, and she says she's reached the decision that she's trans, perhaps has taken a male name, and is deeply motivated Mm -hmm. to um, move into affecting her body Mm -hmm. in one way or another. Mm -hmm. What is the other perspective of holding that? Right. Well, first of all, I just want to make it really clear. I don't work with teens of any kind. I don't see teens clinically for anything, and especially not this. And part of the reason is because working with teens is just not something that's in my wheelhouse. But also because I have been writing and speaking about it, it would just feel almost like a conflict of interest to also be working with it. So I've, I've spoken with a lot of parents, and that's sort of the perspective that I hold. So just to clarify, I have some imaginations about how I might work with a teen in this position, but just to clarify, I, I'm not doing that work. So I think, I think the, the answer to your question in one word, though, is curiosity. And curiosity is really the coin of the realm, as far as I'm concerned, in analysis. Whatever comes up, we want to be curious about it. And, and so I would be, I would want to be curious with this, uh, with this person. I would, I would want to know, and let's just use they pronouns because that will sort of uh, just simplify, but I would want to know when they, when they discovered, uh, this concept and, you know, how do they arrive at this, uh, desire to transition? I would be curious about all aspects of their experience, also those ones not apparently related to identifying as trans. What is their life like? What is their external life like? What is their internal life like? I'm thinking about James Hollis, who is a well-known Jungian author, who says that when someone comes into the consulting room, that what it's about is not what it's about. Exactly. So um, you're a mantra about being curious of what else is going on here. There's much, much more to this particular kind of client than the expressed wish to change gender. And I would say that there's always more, right? It's it's not of course just, there is. So we're we're not saying well this doesn't have validity. We're just saying we're always complex and all of our desires are complex and multi-layered and what we do in analysis is we explore that yes i also Um, want to say that there was an old psychoanalytic contract that when somebody decided to come into let's say a freudian analysis back in the day that they would make an explicit agreement that they would not institute any significant life changes when they were in analysis 
because it was expected that as the psyche really opens and unfolds and these powerful feelings were emerging, that they might temporarily feel like they want to change careers or leave a spouse or make a radical difference. The analyst knew that was going to happen and knew it had to be examined. And the analyst would be rather fierce Mm -hmm. about um, these are not actionable impulses while you are exploring them. They may at some point Mm -hmm. be, but we have to allow the psyche to talk to us before we act on it, Mm -hmm. or else we're going to wind up with a lot of defenses to the unconscious speaking because we are afraid Mm -hmm. that we will have to act on it. And that shows up in many different realms of treatment. Say more about that, about being afraid to explore the impulse because we're afraid we might have to act on it. Well, this shows up a lot in homophobia. I mean, I'm down in Virginia Beach. I work with a very large military community. And sometimes um, one of the tensions and agonies that a young man might bring into the consulting office is that he's noticed um, some amount of homoerotic feeling towards his uh, cohorts there, or even um, homosexual fantasies. And um, he's tried uh, tremendously to banish this, to make it disallowed, to drink it away, to um, pursue women madly as a demonstration that he doesn't have homoerotic impulses. And so the only way that that can be safely explored in the analysis is to let him know that are talking about these fantasies is not a prelude to you becoming gay. That it's totally premature. We don't know where this is going to go. And that there are all kinds of symbolic um, values Mm -hmm. in terms of your fantasies that also need to be honored before a conclusion is reached. Mm -hmm. And people need the safety of knowing this is not actionable, or we agree it will not Mm -hmm. be actionable, as we explore it, or else they'll keep it hidden away. One of the issues here is um, that it's so much easier to explore issues around other things than it is to explore issues around sexuality. Sexuality is a really hot topic. We're wired this way. And so it's harder to stay curious and to stay open about this, much harder than it is, say, something about career change. You know, that what if a young man came into your office saying, "Um, I don't think I'm really cut out for military life, and I always thought about being a teacher or a chef or something. It wouldn't be quite as immediately loaded, I think, as uh, issues related to sexuality. Mm -hmm. I'd like to challenge that, actually. Oh, okay. That, you know, separating Mm. yourself from the military after 10 years is a very loaded decision Mm. because there are enormous repercussions Mm. for them in terms of their career and many and their financial well-being that I have had clients agonize about whether or not they would separate from the military because that leads to questions of, um, identity and autonomy because the military tells you who you're going to be on their mm. behalf and it owns you. You can't just walk off the job. So leaving all of that incredible amount of structure and then going into this free fall of the marketplace, just as an example, is tremendously loaded. So they do need to be able to feel, we're not going to talk about resignation. We're going to talk about your fantasies. Yeah, you know, Where sometimes you going how that? I put that is I say, let's just be playful. We're yeah. just playing with it right now. But I've seen people weep uh-huh. talking about that stuff yeah, just yeah. to say that it can be deeply unexpected as to how hot some of these topics are. Mm-hmm. What I'm thinking yeah. about is that I, you're right. Any topic can be very, very hot for a particular person or a particular aspect of the culture. But I'm thinking that sexuality, uh, um, maybe this has its taproot in Freud, is collectively, almost automatically, a hot topic. And if I can jump in there, um, you know, a lot of, and by the way, talking about teen girls wanting to transition, it's about, it looks like, and these are sort of rough numbers gleaned from a couple different sources, 70 to 80% natal female. There's another 20 to 30% that are natal male. And I think it's possibly some of them are a sort of different kind of presentation, but it's not totally clear yet. In any case, what we're finding, because I do have colleagues that work with these girls, and what we're finding is that many of them have had no sexual experience at all. They often haven't had any relationships. 
They uh, may not even really know to whom they're attracted, and they don't have a sense of their own bodies and their own pleasure. So these are these are girls who are wanting to cast aside their natural biology before they even have a relationship with it. So th- that's really astonishing from our symbolic perspective mm-hmm. that 70 to 80% of teenage girls want to transition to becoming male when they're just teenagers. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? What does it say about our collective that this is a these are big numbers and it's a big trend? Well, just to clarify, it's not 70 to 80% of all girls. It's of right. those teens who are seeking <laughs> transition services, 70, 80% are girls. And this is new. It was always more natal males. The flip in the sex ratio has been worldwide. It's been noticed in Canada. It's been noticed in the UK. It's been noticed in Finland. It's been noticed in uh, the Netherlands. Um, I believe there's also data from Australia. So this is a, gl- and certainly in the US, it's a global trend. And no one really understands it because some people say, well, it's more acceptable now. But then you would also expect to see older women transitioning in the same numbers, and we're not. It's really the teens. So what I think, and this, you know, just sort of hit me just right away, is that, you know, mass psychogenic illness, uh, mass hysterias always disproportionately affect teen girls. I mean, you could go all the way back to the Middle Ages. And it's predominantly adolescent females who fall prey to things like the laughing sickness in, I think that was in Nigeria. It was teen girls. I mean, go back and pick up the crucible and read that. It was teen girls. Anorexia in the 70s and 80s, teen girls. Bulimia, teen girls. Cutting, teen girls. And, you know, I think that um, teen girls may be perhaps particularly Uh, predisposed to somatizing distress. I think it's a difficult time. It may be more difficult than ever to be a teen girl because uh, social media has just really changed the landscape. And I think, uh, I've been thinking about this a lot in terms of the nature of psychiatric diagnosis. And I'm going to put a little asterisk there because I'll come back to this in a second. But, you know, the psyche, the unconscious looks for ways to express distress that will have kind of cultural currency in the culture. And at one point, maybe it's, you know, Karen Carpenter has a heart attack because she's so anorexic. Anorexia becomes the way. There's been a lot of attention in the media to transgender stuff in the past 10 or 15 years. Now this is the way. This is the way that teen girls are saying, I feel distress. I I don't know. I don't have words for it. The psyche doesn't have words. The unconscious speaks in images, symptoms, and symbols. So it's an interesting uh, change of this, uh, what form it takes, whether it takes the form of this laughing sickness or uh, an eating disorder or bodily harm or, or now wishing to change your right. sexual or hysteria identity. at the end of the 19th century. Yes. That was a predominantly female disease too. That's another kind of correlate, I think. So let's let's drop into into a couple of things you brought up. One is that there seems to be something happening in the psyches of teenage girls globally that makes them vulnerable to this kind of collective phenomena. So I, I would I would welcome hearing your theory about first of all theory about this idea of um, psychological um, contagion or trending in the collective Mm -hmm. that shows up. And then secondly, why would teenage girls be more vulnerable to that than a a different subgroup? Well, um, so first of all, social contagion is a really well-documented phenomenon. I mean, there are people who know far more about it than I do. Can can you define it it, though? We're we're using some very specific words. Well, so so it's well-documented that thoughts, behaviors, beliefs, and feelings can be communicable socially, just like a you know an actual pathogen. So, for example, suicide. Suicide's a great a great example. It it can happen in clusters, often in teenagers, uh, where you know uh, one teen maybe in a school does it, and then two months later there's another one. 
But all kinds of things are, including good things, are communicable. I mean, I believe that you're more likely to be happy if you live in a neighborhood with other happy people. I mean, there's there's lots and lots written about it. I can't cite it all chapter and verse, but of course, you know, we 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 influence each other all the time in ways we don't even fully realize. So even this fashion idea. trends are, yeah. you right. know, socially communicable. I remember uh, some of them we look back on with dismay, such as polyester bell-bottomed pants, for example. <laughs> um, and that was, uh, you know, socially communicated. So there are values and ideas and trends that suddenly become noticed in the collective and then are normalized. Like I can remember right after Saturday Night Fever came out, oh, yes. that all of a sudden it became interesting to wear different kinds of clothing. Or then all of a sudden John Travolta does Urban Cowboy and everyone's wearing like cowboy shirts within like six uh -huh. months, where that would have seemed ridiculous in certain settings. So there's a way that something can be feel possible, can feel reachable, um, that it can be comfortably integrated into the personality when it really seems to achieve a certain kind of critical mass in the collective. And I think people in media certainly see that. And we see it when we notice that something goes viral, you know, a video goes viral. It's very mysterious as to how does it happen as if the collective has its own mind. Well, and that's a great, the viral thing brings up this, this thing that really has me worried is I think that, you know, things, feelings, behaviors, thoughts, et cetera, have always been communicable. And I would add, you know, sort of psychiatric diagnoses too, for the most, for the most part, it's a little more complicated than that. But, but with the internet, I think it has really multiplied the degree to which these things can be spread. And spread more quickly and more widely. And more widely. Yes. And, and there is some, you know, delving into this topic and talking to lots of parents and, and detransitioners, people who went through a gender transition and then reversed it to identify with their natal sex again. A lot of them will say, yeah, I found it on the internet. You know, if you read the news reports about, you know, they'll do these kinds of puff pieces about the transgender firemen or something. And, you, you read it and it's like, yeah, I found it, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I felt uncomfortable. And then I was watching YouTube and I found that this was possible. It's like, it's like these categories are disseminated by the internet and they give us new ways to understand ourselves. And they have to log into something that is in the collective unconscious that there's something that does catch fire uh, versus many things that you know never get any traction. Uh, I'm very curious about the symbolic significance of uh, today of some girls wishing to transition to becoming male mm -hmm. and what that means about being a guy in this culture. Is it about agency, independence, individualism, having a wider range of options, where does it appear Not to- Not being just a sex object. Hmm. I mean, I, th I think that yeah. I, th I have a hunch that porn is a big problem for for teens. And the, the expectations about what sex should be are really being defined for this generation by porn. Yes, absolutely. I think it's an enormous phenomena and is causing a lot of problems. Yeah. Yeah. I, it really it worries me. And I, and I think honestly, I feel like a lot of parents aren't, aren't aware of how big a problem well, it is. Well, and a lot of parents are co-participating. I mean, we're in a generation yeah. of people in their thirties that have been raised with their first experience being with pornography. It's normalized for them and they're having children or mm -hmm. have had children. Mm -hmm. So yes, they may have feelings of whether or not it should be available to your teenage kid, but there's a way in which it's already in the psyche of the family because it's normalized by the parents. And, uh, you know, this porn is a complicated subject that we could sort of That'd take, take it another time. Yeah. But what I will say is, hypothetically, if you're a teen girl and what you've learned is sex is rather brutal, a lot of the porn has a lot of uh, BDSM stuff in it. There's, there's a lot of anal stuff in it. And if you're a 14 year old girl and you think that that's what awaits you, I mean, that's, that could be a little overwhelming and it might make you want to dissociate from your sexuality and your female body. Now, I'm not saying that that those, those appetites couldn't be appropriate 
for for someone somewhere. But if you're inundated with it as a young teen, I think we have some thinking to do about that. So one idea in your thesis is that young girls are being frightened out of owning their own bodies and the implications of becoming um, sexually active as girls. Perhaps. Yeah. I mean, I'm not the only person to suggest this. There are a lot of feminists that have put this mm-hmm. thesis forward. And mm-hmm. I don't I don't have evidence that this is the case, but it just seems possible. Mm-hmm. So that's one piece. But I, I still, and I can't speak to this um, as a man, but calling upon your own experience of being teenage girls, David Lisa, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what do you think is perhaps universal about being a teenage girl that 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 makes one vul- more vulnerable mm-hmm. to this pressure to conform or, or adapt, to express distress in a somatized way. Okay, great. Okay, let's yeah. let's go there. So um, there's actually a French psychoanalyst that has noted uh, that has come up with a hypothesis that teen girls may be more prone to somatization because a woman's sexuality is more diffuse. It's sort of like our our sexuality and our the way we experience sex is pretty much all over our bodies. You know, men, you guys kind of have a focal point. <laughs> <laughs> but um but for for teen girls it's different. I mean for women it's different. And it may be that that's part of what leads us as we're coming into our sexuality to have difficulty maybe even squaring that new relationship with our developing sexual self. Well, I'm interested too in what you asterisked before mm-hmm. about categories of diagnosis and symptomatology, the, the channels that it takes, and how different those channels can be uh, in different times and in different cultures. And that it, so that we're, really uh, walking on dangerous ground when we concretize a symptom too greatly and focus on that uh, because there have been some really unusual symptoms. I'm remembering your uh, description of the uh, the glass delusion, which was a legitimate disorder. But tell about that because it it illustrates the point perfectly. It was the most common psychiatric disorder in the, uh, I think it, yeah, I think it was in the Middle Ages to into the Renaissance, if I'm getting my dates right. <laughs> um, but it was it started with I think it was Charles. Oh, you're putting me on the spot. I think it was Charles the Seventh, King of France, and he had clearly had some stuff going on with his mental health. And part of what would happen is he would go through these periods where he thought he was made of glass. And he would need to be bundled very carefully because he was worried he might break. And all of, you know, his seats had to have cushions on them. And from there, it spread so that, you know, Cervantes wrote a short story about it. Descartes mentioned it. Um, There were poems written about it. And there were lots and lots of sufferers of the glass delusion, people who thought they were made of glass. And then it sort of died away. You know, it's um, there have always been people who starved themselves throughout history across time and place. Mm. Tiny, tiny numbers, small numbers of people would, for whatever reason, sort of stop eating, often women. But it looked different in the Middle Ages in Europe than it looked in Hong Kong, say, in the 1960s. I mean, it was one of those things that, you know, psychology interns might get called in to see the person. It's like, oh, you should see this because you'll never see it again. That's how rare it was. But they but they were out there in small, small numbers. But then something happens where it becomes it becomes the symptom language of that generation's distress. I'm thinking about anorexia mm-hmm. as, um, you know, what part of a person is starving? Yes. It, it's a metaphor. It's a, it's, a, it's a symbolic language. Exactly. And what, you know, we're exploring what is the metaphor for a teen girl who wants to transition to male? What was the metaphor for people in Europe who thought they were made of glass? It's, it's uh, all the images, very uh, metaphorically rich, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and if we can uh, at least entertain the possibility of these symptoms being metaphors 
um, it might take us down a multiplicity of roads and to it, understanding. You know, a lot of people have sort of said, have asked me, well, what is it? What is the metaphor? And for me, I think it has something to do with uh, that, that gender dysphoria at its root really speaks to a profound loss of connection with our embodied instinctual selves. Mm. And, and, you know, in, and in our culture, we are so dissociated from nature, from instinct, from body. And the idea that you could change your body at will and that it would be your mind that would have to determine your body that the two things, I mean, it's really a Cartesian dichotomy taken to an absurd degree, that the mind should have to decide what the body is and that we would have to use modern medical technologies to change the body, to me, speaks to uh, this dissociation from instinct. I, I want to read a quote from Jung, if I may. Um, so this is a pretty well-known quote, and it's a good one. Uh, He says, we think we can congratulate ourselves on having already reached such a pinnacle of clarity, imagining that we have left all these phantasmal gods far behind. But what we have left behind are only verbal specters, not the psychic facts that were responsible for the birth of the gods. We are still as much possessed by autonomous psychic contents as if they were Olympians. Today, they are called phobias, obsessions, and so forth. In a word, neurotic symptoms. The gods have become diseases. Zeus no longer rules Olympus, but rather the solar plexus and produces curious specimens for the doctor's consulting room or disorders the brains of politicians and journalists who unwittingly let loose psychic epidemics on the world. Oh my goodness. I know. That is right on. I know. And and what I what's embedded in here for me is this idea of he says these are the psychic facts that were responsible for the birth of the god. So what is that? Right? These are these are kind of archetypal energies that are really protean. They don't have form of their own, but they're powerful and they need to sort of borrow form to be understood. And that's, I think that's uh, the psychic movement from the archetypal realm uh, into the visible world is we cannot really see or understand our archetypes, but they result in images, they result in ideas, they have to become manifest Manifest. in the world or manifest in our bodies in some way. But we make a mistake if we reduce it simply to that without looking a little deeper with more curiosity and giving it more time to see what are the psychic facts here, what God wants to be made known Mm -hmm. that's currently manifesting in someone's solar plexus. So I'm, I'm resting in the foundation that we've laid out in this discussion, which is informed very much by Lisa's rigorous research and her communication with the trans community and parents, that there is a phenomena happening, which is statistically validated, that uh, a substantial amount of uh, teenage girls have... Um, adopted this idea that uh, they are transgender and have a lot of energy to move forward in that transition process. And Lisa and undoubtedly any number of parents and analysts feel an inadequate amount of understanding and a tremendous amount of caution in terms of lending a bunch of support to that trajectory without really understanding what's going on. So I don't know that any of us here have absolute answers, which is part of the mystery of the archetypes and the collective unconscious, but I think it would be, um, we have to be bold to perhaps even theorize what could be going on and could we, do we even get a hint of or a scent of what's moving through the larger atmosphere around this? So one of the things that I want to um, just introduce is Jung's very classic idea that part of being born in a particular sex and consequently identifying with that in some fashion, at least early in life, constellates an image of the opposite sex in the unconscious. So every teenage girl has a vibrant and powerful image of a man, a masculine inside of her. And that 
exploring this psychologically and imaginally, as the life proceeds, there is a, a, an unfolding relationship between her feminine sex and perhaps ego structure and the masculine figure inside of her. Jung does write in a couple of places and acknowledges that the internal contrasexual image can at times become incredibly powerful and make incredible demands and even decisions in the life and demand um, attention. And that could be interpreted in a lot of different ways, including the idea of becoming a different sex, a different gender. And, and uh, Jung acknowledged it. He thought for the average person that a woman, um, at, particularly at middle age, does need to find her inner man mm -hmm. and does need to see him and even, in a sense, marry him to create a kind of amalgam. So when Jung was looking for this mystery in terms of the collective unconscious, he was astounded to find the images that alchemists were using uh, based on their fantasies around chemical amalgams. And he was fascinated by this idea that an image of the masculine and the image of the feminine would go through a mystical transformation and merge and become a divine hermaphrodite. And that that was symbolic of an amalgam of things that would come together. Something wholeness, right? The, the, he thought it would lead mm -hmm. to wholeness and that there were other derivations around that. Maybe the amalgam would fail to happen and and the substance would land back in an extreme example of one of the different polarities. Mm. But I think we are talking about this um, struggle in holding the tension of the polarities mm. inside of the psyche. Mm. And there might be many different mythological or fairy tale uh, amplifications of this mm -hmm. um, almost impossible tension. And so what we're also talking about is a young girl comes, she has this incredible tension in her. The image of herself as a man or a masculine has so much power and is demanding so much of her and of her parents and of the medical system. How do we relate to that? in a way that honors her experience, but perhaps allows the arc of a larger process so, to so, emerge, maybe. Mm -hmm. So what we're really pointing to, what you're pointing to, is we've discussed this in its more sort of pathological aspect, and you're pointing to the telos of, is there here a hidden quest for this kind of conjunctio? that gets concretized prematurely as a re, you know as a desire to become physically the opposite sex but that there is a healthy there's a kernel there of yeah, reaching so, towards something yes there is a telos, larger greater right. more wholeness and if we think about it um, and this is actually a great suffering for transgender individuals that let's say a young girl does have the uh, breasts removed and goes through a phalloplasty and has an, uh, a genital reassignment surgery, there is a way in which she is an amalgam. Mm -hmm. She is always yes. genetically a woman, mm -hmm. but has this other amalgam happening in her body mm -hmm. uh, and is left with that tension of those two factors ever in the body. Mm -hmm. despite the fantasy that there would be an absolute transformation into its opposite. Right, and we always have to suffer the tension, don't we? And that goes to also the great satisfaction that, um, dissatisfaction, excuse me, that I have um, heard with some of my um, female to male transgender clients where the surgery and the plastic surgery has not caught up mm -hmm. to their fantasies. So there's a tremendous amount of painful dissatisfaction that they cannot possess a fully operative or even aesthetically mm -hmm, mm -hmm. pleasing male genitalia. It's very, very painful mm -hmm. because the archetype continues to demand incarnation of the child. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether this is the truth. It's just a model. But um, as I lean into Lisa's desire to question what might be happening instead of moving so quickly into the alchemical laboratory. Mm -hmm. It's worth just thinking about, perhaps. But I wonder if there's other, other archetypal stories we can make of this. 
Well, I, I mean, just sort of staying with with your uh, talking just for a, a minute more about your idea of the contrasexual. Jung called that, of course, the anima and the animus. And, you know, that is a part, I mean, this is sort of classic Jung, right? He felt like that could give us problems. He felt that his own inner woman was uh, kind of giving him a hard time for a while. But when related to in the right way, it can become, uh, a, it can lead us into life. It can lead us into our depths. It can be very important in our creative life. So that part of the psyche that is in classical Jungian thought conceptualized as contrasexual is extremely important. I mean, he chose the Latin word for soul to describe it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I do think, although I, you know, I'm not sure this is the whole picture, but if we're understanding it, like you're saying, Joseph, like this might be a demand of say the animus for incarnation, of course, of course, you could incarnate it in different ways, right? You don't have to sort of physically transition. You could try to kind of embody your inner masculine in a more symbolic way, say, by experimenting with being more assertive or fierce or uh, loud or some of the things that we've traditionally assigned to males. That might Mm be one way of thinking about Mm -hmm. it. And even if we step away from the idea of just maleness and replace it with the word agency, Mm -hmm. and that's a kind of a social work term that we're all familiar with here, this idea of of potently acting in the world Mm -hmm. in any number of realms, which can be characterized as a male image or a phallic image Mm -hmm. even, Mm -hmm. to have a phallic a phallus on the body is to penetrate, is to inseminate, is to be erect and strong uh, and thrumming in a certain kind of way. And what are the analogs of that? And what are the ways in which that's being cut off or disallowed mm-hmm. and, and lacking a strategy for finding that, connecting to that, than these other kinds of ritualized possibilities might emerge in the culture, maybe. Mm-hmm. In an analytic situation, this also requires time. And I think, as we've talked before, Lisa, that's one of your pleas and the things that you were hoping that the transgender community, parents, practitioners will hear is that discovering what these images, impulses, and drives mean takes time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it always does. I mean, when when someone comes in for analytic work around anything, Yes. It's always like, we don't know what we're going to find. We really just don't know what we're going to find. So let's open it up and take it out and lay it out. And little by little, the picture starts to come together. And, uh, you know, it, it, it evolves and it shows itself. You know, the psyche will show what it, what it wants. I mean, w- one of my thoughts, Joseph, is that I, I really do see that a transition process can very much, it's almost like there's sort of two extremes, I think, and it often falls one or the other. It's such a difficult thing to do to be transgender. It's such a difficult way to live. It requires such a differentiation from the collective to do something outside, so outside of the mainstream, that many trans people have gone through intense inner work, whether or not they've ever set foot inside a therapist's office. But they've really had to sit with a lot of tension for a long time. And many of them that I've had discussions with have done just that kind of personal work in one way or another. And and therefore, you know, they wind up being you know, really deeply individuated people who, because they've had to really look at themselves and ask hard questions about themselves and ask hard questions about their relationship with the collective. So it can be just that kind of thing where it's truly individuating in the Jungian sense, or if it's going along with what the trend is, is, for example, in the case, I think, in many teen girls, it's sort of the opposite of individuation because you're, you're, you're going along with a tribe. So I think that's really interesting. And that goes to what we hope will be the safety of the analytic discourse, which is that nobody is fighting anything. We're wanting to talk about it. Mm-hmm. That nothing should be off the table for discussion. 
even if it evokes tremendous feeling, which also involves speaking to somebody with a strong transgender drive to manifest in them, to slow down and to appreciate the danger of urgency, which is not to denigrate their interest in it or even to obstruct uh, the fact that they may eventually decide to go through with all of the process to to move to the opposite sex but not to be afraid to ask difficult questions and that's something that i so admire lisa for doing that she is saying stop and think stop and ask difficult and uncomfortable questions well that's the work of analysis that's what we do exactly So we uh, have been noticing, the three of us, while we've been recording this episode, we've actually paused the recorder a couple times and sort of checked in with each other. And and what we're noticing is our energy is a little different this time. Usually, we often don't stop at all when we're recording, uh, and it just kind of flows. But it's like we haven't, I, I don't know, we've had, Joseph at one point was feeling like he wasn't really in the room, and you know, I, th- I think it's, you know, at times we've sort of been surprised that maybe there's, there's, there's been some deadness because it's such a hot topic. And so we're wondering what's going on. What is the field that's being created? I think that's exactly uh, right. And we're kind of modeling this sort of process that we might have anyway in an analytic situation of that this is confusing and it's, this is very muddy and murky. And, and what does it tell us? Exactly. The path is not uh, clear, and I don't think we really understand it in the collective. It, it is a real, relatively new trend, and we don't have the benefit yet of hindsight. It's easy to be kind of glib about that glass delusion that took place in France some centuries ago. Um, but we're really groping here. And I'm wondering about where the the forward trajectory or what Jungians call the telos might be. We've tried to understand it from the through the lens of symptomatology and metaphor, but is there more here that is trying to be expressed that might be in the service of at least an effort toward wholeness mm-hmm. in times that I think we might agree are, at the very least, turbulent. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that the three of us are are grappling with is how powerfully affected we are by talking about the topic. And even though we're being very temperate and regulated in the uh, delivery of our ideas, all of us are feeling a kind of thrumming in the room and trying to grab at why is it so hard to be really objective? Why is it hard to float above and talk about it in a really transcendent way? I'm not sure it's possible for all of this to really be in consciousness. It's too big. And there's something vague, something loaded. There's a a lot of energy in this that, that, doesn't feel like it can just be reduced and expressed in words and contained. It's bigger than that. And so we're, as we sit here, the three of us have generated something amongst us that we can't quite grasp together. It's as if there's an it here in the room. Mm -hmm. And And a chemical monstrosity. (laughs) (laughs) Right. It's as if a kind of metaphorically, a spirit has descended in the room, which is perhaps somehow related to what we're talking about in the collective, that we have evoked this incredible phenomena and how elusive it is. And that reminds me a little bit of the spirit Mercurius, Mm -hmm. this idea of this, you know, combustive spirit that moves through things and is so swift you can't get a glimpse of it but there's these flashes and of light and heat and confusion and passion that just seem to be happening throughout mm-hmm. the whole conversation mm-hmm. that is mysterious and that's i think part of why 
It's scary. Yeah, you, it feels dangerous. Yes, it does so feel dangerous. dangerous. The topic was, feels dangerous. I think yeah. we're sitting here thinking, gosh, are our listeners going to like send us raging emails <laughs> or like, you know, it's so hot mm-hmm. as a topic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it does. It is it feels, scary. Yeah. It is a very scary topic because we're tinkering with our very humanity of the, our species has been on the planet like many other species for a long, long time, or Jung's uh, 200 million year old man. Mm-hmm. And we're playing with something that is gigantic and that has never been possible before. And to some, to some extent, it's still kind of un thinkable it does we can't just get it in our frontal cortexes and just think about it mm-hmm. it's much much bigger mm-hmm. it goes to the core of who we are yeah i mean it when you start really thinking about these issues deeply you are thinking about what it means essentially to be human and what it means to take that kind of power into our own hands of the the control over over life itself mm-hmm. and how we will, you know, our physical destinies, what has been given and and simply tweaking that or tinkering it. And what does that mean? We are essentially, I think genetically, one still remains male or female in most cases, despite uh, surgeries and hormones that change the appearance. So the whole thing is deep, it's confusing, it's big, and I know I can't really wrap myself around it. Mm -hmm. When you were talking, Deb, about the idea of of the power to make these kinds of decisions and the power to set Mm -hmm. them in motion, I mean, I could feel this kind of gasp in my soul. Uh, And I've accompanied uh, transgender clients through surgery and reassignment and into their new lives. So I want to say that, you know, I've I have a very open position about this uh, this phenomena, but I think um, I've also seen the way a client who is approaching a decision of this magnitude kind of fade out for a while and not be able to fully grasp what it means to have this uh, substantial kind of surgery and transformation, that it is an unprecedented demand on consciousness Mm -hmm. to fully, fully feel and own the magnitude of a decision like this. And so what I sometimes see with clients who are in my office that transitioned decades ago is that the decision is still landing. Mm -hmm. It's still thrumming Mm -hmm. like a kettle drum through their lives because it just is so godlike. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. And and I think, you you know, that may be sort of the archetype. You know, we were talking a little bit before about images like Talos from the Greek myth where there's different versions, but one of them, Hephaestus, helped create this uh, this sort of iron man to help protect uh, the island of Crete. And it's this idea of the of taking on this godlike power to create. Now you're not creating, but you are shaping the human body and and that there's there's something about that maybe being kind of uh, hypertrophied intellect cut off from the instincts where you're kind of arrogating this godlike power to form the human body. And although we can say that in that kind of crisp, thoughtful language, to really sit in the face yeah. of that is, is astounding. And I, I wonder now what's landing for me, if that's what we're troubled by, is that the ability to do something so radical and extraordinary is truly awe filled and and we've lost Mm -hmm. contact with that you know in several generations ago when people would use the word awful they would talk about terror and dread and overwhelming intensity that the kind of feeling that you might have 
as a tornado is approaching you mm-hmm. and you fall to your knees. Well, it's this dark numinosity. Mm-hmm. It's a yes, and and that was a frequent word used to describe God in the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. That to face a force of of that magnitude psychologically or in in reality fills us with awe. But awe isn't as clever as hey, awesome. <laughs> but we've lost yeah. the mm-hmm. the language for awe. And I think perhaps that's the trouble, is that our young people slipping into the process of transitioning gender and and there is no awe in the process. Right. There's no there's no conscious relationship with the transcendent. It's too casual, mm-hmm. it's, perhaps. It, and and it, no one's carrying the awe. And so the awe is pounding like like heat yeah. lightning in the room, and everyone's pretending that they're just having crackers and tea or something, mm-hmm. and not attending to the awe. Mm-hmm. Uh, that lands it for me. Mm-hmm. That's just true mm-hmm. for me right mm-hmm. now. What's up for me is, um, yes, it's awe-filled, like it's a Promethean venture. It is Prometheus stole fire from the gods, and the gods retaliated in a particularly awful way by chaining him to a rock, and an an eagle would uh, gnaw his liver out from his side during the day, and then it would regrow at night. So this horrible sort of torture uh, continued day in and day out. And that I think that may be, for me anyway, the archetypal image that's in the room is that it is a Promethean venture to change one's body in this way. And is there going to be a, a, a consequence that is unanticipated if it simply becomes a medicalized procedure like um, plastic surgery or something. Or having your appendix out. Mm-hmm. I've actually had a, a transgender friend who I'm really close to say that, that they really resented the barriers mm-hmm. to surgery and that having uh, one's breasts removed or a hysterectomy or a phalloplasty should be no more scrutinized than the need to get your appendix out. And so I, I can I, I get it. I get it that people want autonomy mm-hmm, yes. and they don't want somebody else regulating their decisions. Yep. And on that level, I'm with it. Because, you know, what makes anybody else wiser than you are about your access to decisions and resources? So on that level, it's like, yeah, you're not a child. Yep. And no one has the right to turn you into a child. That said, the comparison there really strips the awe, yes, the magnitude of what's happening out yeah. of it, which then takes that magnitude and throws it into the unconscious. And as you're saying, Deb, when does that return and how does it return mm-hmm. later? And it may not necessarily be pathologic, but it's going to return because it's just so big. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think you're onto and, something. And teenagers Joseph. are not old enough to engage in this kind of Promethean venture. And they must defend themselves against it. They they can't. They couldn't tolerate the magnitude. Having a conscious yes. relationship yes. with this decision. Absolutely. I think, you know, just like with everything else, it's all about how it's held. And if it's really held consciously, then I think that's when you have that element of awful, that you realize how momentous this is. Right. I'm thinking of a trans friend that I have, and you know, her surgery was for her this profound initiation, mm-hmm. and and it was awful mm-hmm. in in this kind of meaningful sense. Yes, it was kind of like being struck by lightning and its magnitude. And she knew it, she had an idea of it, and her psyche, it sounds like, was thrumming with it. So there's a way in which you can, it's its no longer in the atmosphere, it's in the person's psyche. And that feels different than when someone is um, too facile mm-hmm. with really any decision, but too facile with Something huge is being defended against. And we would say the same thing to make a little bit of a false equivalency. But if someone just said in, you know, yesterday I thought I'm going to leave my marriage. And so today I filed for the divorce. I'm just gone. I'm just out the door. And you'd be like, whoa, like what? Mm -hmm. It's too facile. Mm -hmm. And, And we certainly have seen clients moving with 
too facilely around things. And and that's a defense. It's, there's a there's a kind of manic, ungrounded quality to it. Yes, absolutely. And I'm glad we've circled around. I know the podcast is a bit long, and you guys hopefully have been with us as you're wrestling and we're wrestling to pull out of the atmosphere the god in the room, mm -hmm. using Jungian term, mm -hmm. and sitting here and just sweating a little bit about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, those of you who are not clinicians, when you're in the cl clinician's chair and a client is coming to you because they really do need your documentation in order to proceed with access to hormones or further surgery, I tell you what, I, as uh, an analyst, I feel the sweat rolling down my back. I feel the awefulness mm -hmm. of, of uh, being in that energy. It's powerful, and it is, of course, not to be taken lightly. And I think that's your that's your concern, Lisa, is you see evidence of certain systems taking it too lightly, and your and perhaps even by your passion around it, you're trying to add an intensity to the discussion that you don't feel is there and should be there. Well, there's a lot of intensity around the discussion, yeah. But but just opening it up and yeah. and wanting to invite a more conscious relationship mm -hmm. with the question, especially for teens. Absolutely. So, oh. we have <laughs> walked around and around this, and perhaps it's time for us to at least transition now to um, taking a look at a dream. So, in today's uh, dream discussion, a female listener, 48 years old, who's a physician, has this dream. I am lying in bed with a man I do not know, and we are both naked. We are covered by a thin blanket. The man's right-hand man comes in the room to discuss something with him. The man in bed with me gets up and does not clothe himself, but nonchalantly takes off his penis and hands it to me. It is not bloody or gory, and he seems to know that he can put it back on. I'm just holding it for him. I'm not sure what to do, so I take it under the blanket and lay it on my lower abdomen. The man tells his partner, as he points to me, that he should take a picture for his dad, because they see the outline of the penis under the blanket. The dreamer offers a little bit of context for us, that she's been working on developing her feeling and feminine side, having grown up in a more thinking and masculine environment, and that she's begun to search for more spiritual fulfillment. She writes that the main feeling in the dream for her was surprise and dis-ease and feeling unsure about what to do. So what do we make of this? Well, I'm reminded of Jung's statement that uh, when he heard a dream, his first reaction was to think to himself that I have no idea what this dream means, and I am exactly in this place. Um, I often have a sort of intuitive take on a dream or a resonance to one of the images or the energy. And um, maybe in the context of our previous discussion, um, I am uh, really flummoxed here. I do have some ideas, but there are things that uh, that that have left me unsure too. The, the ending of the dream is curious that he should take a picture for his dad because they see the outline of the penis under the blanket. Okay. So one of the things that I notice is there's sort of four people in this dream, right? There's the dreamer who's female, the man she was in bed with, the right hand man and the dad sort of by implication. By implication, And yeah. so there's three males and one female. So there's there's something here about the masculine and the feminine. And um, yeah, the, the, <laughs> the feminine side is, the feeling feeling feminine side is kind of outnumbered, isn't it? I think so. There's a, there's a lot of uh, penises in the room. <laughs> <Yes, there are. laughs> and one of them is detachable. Absolutely. So, is Nonchalantly so detachable. It's, I love it when dreams are just kind of funny. I mean, that's a funny image, right? Well, and it's my funny. thought about humor is yeah. that last sentence that they're going to take a picture for his dad, I could see two men doing that because they think it would be funny. 
<laughs> and I guess if I had the dreamer, that would be one of my questions is how come a picture? Now, you know what? I'm in a different place. And I think one of the reasons for my flummoxed is um, there is an image of dismemberment in this dream. And I instinctively shied away from it. Mm-hmm. Of You cannot just take a penis off and hand it to someone. And the feeling tone is not nonchalant, or it wouldn't be. Yeah. You know, so there's some way that I feel uh, uh, that the awe mm-hmm. and the awfulness yeah. is being denied yep. under this feeling of sort of everything's very casual. She's lying in, naked in bed with a man that she doesn't even know covered just by a thin blanket, which wouldn't provide much warmth. And then there's this discussion and the detachable penis and take a picture of it and send it to dad. Yeah, that's that's true. This this content is really big, but the feeling tone. Feeling tone. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, you're you're right. Yes, I mean, I think we can see it that way from a naturalistic interpretation. I, I find myself and perhaps as a defense, wanting to um, move into a more symbolic attitude around it, that in older religious practices, that the wand was a representation of the penis. And the wand that would be held in the magus's hand and then directed upward or towards other objects would be a way of directing will and agency. So this is a woman who's developing on the feeling side because she feels she has too much animus. And when men leave her, they leave their penises with her. Mm -hmm. That she's the one who's holding all the animus energy, and the men who walk away from her are somehow emasculated Mm -hmm. or castrated. And that is a problem that women can experience. This is a woman who's accomplished, she's a doctor, she's gotta be a dynamo. You can't get through medical school unless you are a dynamo. And she already has very, very strong energy. So I suspect that that's been a problem, that men feel or act castrated around her. And she's left kind of holding the bag. Now, if a man is good humored about it, nonchalant, they'll just let her hold the bag. So she's going to be the man in the relationship, so to speak, directive, powerful. She's going to be the primary will force. And he's going to nonchalantly hang out with his buddies, take some photographs, and she's the one standing there holding the penis in the relationship. And I suspect that that's something she's confronting right now in spades. Hmm. (laughs) You're smiling. What are you thinking? I'm not so sure about that. I mean, maybe, but but I guess what's giving me pause about it is her her reaction, her feeling reaction to the dream when he hands when he hands her his penis. She says, I'm surprised. I'm a little uneasy. I'm unsure of what to do. It's not like, oh, yeah, I better give it to me, baby. You know, she. this is like, what? What's happening? So there's a sense of something. I think this is something new here. And, and I don't know what it is. You know, I'm sort of with Deb. Mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not really sure. But there's something about, I don't know, there's something about laying the, this uh, disembodied penis on her lower abdomen for me that feels, that feels something you know, and then I and then I think I I'm thinking I'm thinking of the myth of Isis and Osiris, hmm. and uh, when Osiris and Joseph, if I'm getting the details wrong, jump in. But he was killed. Osiris and Isis were the kind of supreme um, god and goddess in Egyptian in the Egyptian pantheon, and Osiris was killed and dismembered and. Isis collected all of his parts and sort of remembered him, but she couldn't find the phallus uh, because <laughs> what was it? A crab absconded with it. Yep. Um, so then she carved a phallus and used it to impregnate herself. And I, you know, that is a that is a very rich image. And I don't, I don't know if it's related to this, but it it feels like it might. It's sort of like. Is this woman going through a sort of self-impregnation, kind of spiritual? Um, that's what I was wondering about, is uh, that Isis then gives birth to the god Horus. So I wonder if there's a, a wish here for generativity mm-hmm. of th- that, that phallic energy, the seminal energy, 
that she could have in order to be generative? And where are we generative? In our abdomens, in Mm -hmm. our wombs, our Mm -hmm. uteruses. Uh, I wonder if there is a wish for that kind of creative new thing. Mm -hmm. But if it were, um, if she were to be impregnated by the phallus through her own efforts, then it would be an uruburic impregnation, the self-impregnation, and and there would be a way in which she was avoiding the otherness. And a lot of powerful people do Mm self-impregnate, that it is a closed cycle. They come up with their ideas, they come up with its gestation, and then they organize the environment to follow the plan. So there's there's a trouble with it being that way. Now, in the myth of Osiris, she attaches the carved wooden phallus to Osiris, and in a fashion, it becomes an instrument of Osiris to connect with her in a way that that it was not possible prior to giving that to him. So he was he was cut off from her through the lack of the connecting wand or the phallus. Mm-hmm. But here now, it's been given to her. She's got to decide what is she going to do with it. So she lays it on the belly, and that could be in the proximity of the womb. And so there's a kind of energetic relationship, but also that if you have a large erect phallus and you're lying on your back, it lays on your upper abdomen if you're a man. Mm -hmm. So she's also giving herself a kinesthetic experience of what it would be like to own the fact that that she has a phallus Mm -hmm. and is approximating her own experience of what it would be like for her to have an Ah, erection. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, it's it seems like this is um, perhaps a, a different kind of experience of the masculine, right? Well, we dream That's, what we don't know. Mm-hmm. So there must be a surprise in this. Mm-hmm. One of the surprises I'm imagining is that I don't think she knows that she collects phallic energy and men walk away feeling castrated. Well, my I think my I think why I'm stumbling on that is mm-hmm. because then the men in the dream are representative of outer world men, yep. and just wondering not that that can't be, but just wanting to keep it in the symbolic. That would be a part of her, mm-hmm. right? The man who hands her the unknown mm-hmm. man who's, that she's in bed with. So, so what what part of her psyche would that be? I mean, I guess I'm really interested in the total lack of feminine energy in the dream other than her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after you said that thing about, you know, the kind of kinesthetic experience of having an erect penis, I'm wondering about the picture at the end. Is that because they're they're looking at it and remarking and they want to take the photo because it's like her with the penis? Well, so photographs are memories. Mm -hmm. They're kind of uh, a moment in time that won't fade Mm -hmm. imagistically. And so the image of her with an erection as if she had an erect penis is then going to be demonstrated to the father. And given that she was raised in a more masculine environment, I mean, I could have the fantasy that she's finally achieved the unconscious desire, which is for her to be her father's son, Mm -hmm. that she's now embodied or approximated in this ritualistic way that she's become a man, mm-hmm. and and there's a snapshot to be brought to the father complex. And I would be so curious. That's a great. That's a great uh, uh, working with that. And I would be really curious to her, to the streamer, how she feels about the end of the dream. Absolutely. But I think you know it's interesting, Deb. Going back to your saying that it kind of feels a little something feels a little dissociative. It's interesting that she says she's been working on feeling because the feeling does feel sort of off in the stream, doesn't it? Right. She's just a little surprised where it might be more horrifying to see someone pull Mm -hmm. their penis off. Yep. Yeah. It's the dream starts with lying in bed naked with a man, you know, and so you know sexual connection is certainly implied. That's kind of what happens when a man and a woman are naked together in in bed. But then when the imagery goes to this uh, dismemberment and the casual attitude, uh, it seems to drift away from what you know the original situation. Mm, that's true. Where yeah. lovemaking was implied, there was there was the oh, that's perfect, Debbie. Because so in the beginning, there's this implication of the possibility of connection. Yeah, and then that goes away. 
goes away and we're just going to take a picture of it and send it to dad. Ah, yeah. Okay. It becomes casual. It's like, you know, what tourists do, you know, you know, look at that, you know, let's take a picture and buy and send it to people so they can, uh, she, she leaves the possibility of the conjunctio, the the connection and the what precipitates the pot the, the leaving of that possibility is the man's right hand man enters that's that was curious language so somehow it's the the addition of this other masculine that's kind of uh, you know kind of right handed we think of the right hand as being associated with consciousness mm-hmm. So there's again, there's almost yeah. like too and much consciousness. A lot of agency, you know. Yeah. Of uh, you know, right hand man is uh, he's my right hand man. He the implication is he gets things done. Um, it's more agency and more power. Of we can get out there and really. And it interrupts the possibility of yeah. conjunctio with this unknown yes. other. Yeah. Okay, that may feel like a place for us to stop for today. Well, we've all worked really hard, and we appreciate our listener who shared her dream. And we wish you all an awe-filled day. (laughs) You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, Help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.